folks, Del Cullum here. I uh, would like to talk to you about uh, two of my favorite critters um, that I think it's important we talk a little bit about. Uh, I did this uh, same talk at the 2019 Long Island Natural History Conference um, just last week. And uh, I, I had a wonderful time and, and I had a great response um, from the crowd. However, I didn't get to finish. They're very tight on time. And um, I ran way over time. And out of respect for everyone else, I, I decided to just cut my, my time short. Um, so I did get to speak a lot about the opossum, but not so much the raccoon. And I really didn't get to speak a, about a lot of the um, uh, um, important stuff of the raccoon that I saved for the end. Also, my videos didn't work on my slideshow, and for for the first time, I used a script, and I realized that I, um, as I always knew in the beginning, that um, a script uh, is not so good for me. I, I need to just uh, speak freely without having to look at a paper. So I, I wanted to do this again properly and uh, talk to you about these two, these two uh, very important critters that I spend a, a much of my life um, having been uh, in tight connection with. And that is, of course, the raccoon and the opossum. And no, I don't have a live opossum here. This is the, the uh, stuffed opossum that I use when I talk about uh, these animals. Uh, particularly the opossum to the kids and, and the younger students that I speak to at the schools. Um, it's important that they actually see something that's realistic. So I use this and other very realistic stuffed animals for my presentations. But here I'm going to use my slideshow. So I'd like to get right into this. So please, uh, let's get going. So I want to talk to you first about the opossum. Okay, there's over a hundred species of opossum in the world and only the Virginia opossum lives in North America and that's between southern Canada and Mexico. What, what's so unique about this animal is all the unique characteristics of it and of course the one being it's the only marsupial in America. It would be the only marsupial in the North American continent. However, the Mexican opossum or Tilacuacha does occupy Mexico. The opossum is often referred to in America as possum. However, in Australia, if you mention a possum, it's a completely different animal than our Virginia opossum. In fact, here you see a picture of the common brush tail possum. So this would be in Australia, if you talk about a possum, this is what, what uh, uh, you would be talking about in a common sense. However, in America, we use possum in reference to the opossum, and quite frankly, that's okay. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. If, if you're, you're, you're here and you're talking about it in that context, everyone would know what you were talking about. Um, and, and it would be fine, so uh, no sweat on that. Opossums may look clumsy, but actually they are uh, very smart, and they're more beneficial to humans than many of their woodland neighbors. Before I get into the benefits, let me talk a little bit about what makes the opossum unique, some more, some more of these unique characteristics. We mentioned the marsupial status, but what does that mean? One of the most recognizable features is that they have a pouch, which is called a marsupium. This is where the babies develop at an early stage of birth and what connects them to their Australian cousins. Their cousins in Australia share this marsupium pouch and that would be the kangaroo, for example. Of course, the wombat and the wallaby and uh, Tasmanian devils even. But most recognizably, everyone would say the, uh, uh, would know the kangaroo and the koala for raising their young in a pouch. Okay, I don't wanna skip over the unique birthing process, so back to the marsupium, okay? First, the female has two uteri, 
which rightly accommodates the bifurcated or the forked penis of the male uh, opossum. 11 to 13 days after mating, up to 20 living embryos, and that's what they are described as living embryos because it's such an early stage of birth. These living embryos, blind and naked, half the size of a honeybee, swim through the mother's fur in search of this marsupium, this pouch. The mother licks a moist path in her hair to the marsupium. And, and this makes the blind transition much easier for these, these living embryos. Once they reach the pouch, they attach to one of the 13 nipples. So only 13 babies can, can survive in the best of circumstances. However, that's not always the case, because really even that depends on all 13 of the teats working properly. If they don't work, the animal won't survive attaching to them. Did she give birth to 20 of these living embryos at birth? Did all 20 of them make it to the marsupium? And were th all 13 teats working and functioning properly? And did 13 attach to those teats properly? So there's a little bit of variable area there uh, for there to be um, not always a uh, full litter, which would be um, 13 at most. They will develop in the marsupium for two to three months, and that's depending on the litter size. And the reason there's a, a month difference is because if there's more room in the marsupium for these, for these living embryos to develop, they'll develop quicker. An average litter is eight joeys. Uh, joeys is what the babies are called, just like a baby kangaroo. So the average litter is eight, and the mother can have one to three litters per year. Once they are big enough, they will emerge from the marsupium and ride on mama's back. Their eyes open at two months, and they're weaned at three months. They are good to be on their own at four to five months, at which point, Mom loses her maternal bond, and as soon as her youngster's attention is drawn elsewhere, they go their separate ways. A lot of the times when I, I get calls to rescue the opossums, I'll find them in window wells, basement window wells. And the reason is, like a lot of um, animals with, that use their tail as, an append, as a feeling appendage, like mice, um, the opossums do too. Traveling at night, they drag that tail along foundations of a house. Sometimes they come to that window well, and of course mom goes around, but the babies follow behind. And some of them don't pay attention, and they walk straight, and boom, they go down into the window well. If mama catches it, she'll turn around, she'll look down there and realize she can't help. It's not like she can reach. She doesn't turn around and drop her tail into the window well for the baby to grab on. She sim simply looks at the baby, realizes the situation quite quickly and then continues to move on with the other babies. Sometimes the other babies will accidentally fall in trying to get closer to the babies. And I've figured this all out because I've taken them out of window wells dozens and dozens of times. In fact, when I get a call for one, I always check them all because I've, more than once have I found that not only is the reported window well have the opossum, but the others will have them as well. Once they're seven to nine inches from the nose to the rump, not the tail now, it's fine to be on the road. So if you ever see a baby out and you can see that they're seven to nine inches from nose to their rump, then, then leave them be, let them go, as long as they look healthy and fine. Opossums have uh, impressive memories, okay? They also have opposable thumbs, which makes them great climbers, just like the raccoon, okay? They can climb up with their nose up and they can climb down with their nose down because they can reverse that those front front uh, thumbs to go completely in 180 degrees and uh, be able to grasp in that direction uh, here you can see that opposable thumb okay reversed as it uh, uh, uses to climb up a tree they also have another very special appendage, okay? This is their prehensile tail, which is not commonly used for hanging and definitely not used for hanging upside down to sleep, but it is, as it's been rumored. However, 
they do use it as a fifth appendage for grabbing, holding objects while walking, or, you know, even for extra stability while climbing or navigating a tree. Of course, they'll use it in, in that manner. They, they have been seen using it to hang, to reach, and the babies are often seen maybe hanging by their tails. However, not for too long, and it's not something they do for long periods. And again, they certainly don't fall asleep hanging by their tails. Of course, monkeys have prehensile tails, but in America, there are a small few other animals who possess this appendage, which makes it unique to the opossum. A couple others would be the harvest mouse. It uses its tail to uh, grab on to things. Um, uh, here's one in the marine world. Uh, a seahorse, of course. We know that a seahorse uses its tail uh, to hold on to aquatic grasses. Uh, another kind of obvious one is in the reptile world. Um, we, don't, we wouldn't think about it much, but then when I tell you it's quite obvious, is a snake. Of course, a snake is com pretty much completely prehensile. However, its tail is specifically used for uh, grabbing and holding on to things and, and other uh, uses for other uh, species of snakes. The opossum also holds a title for the most teeth in a mammal in America with a beautiful set of 50 that they love to show off with a smile. The only other mammal that possesses more teeth is the giant armadillo, which again is not uh, here in America, but south in Mexico. The giant armadillo has a less impressive and mostly hidden set of 80 to 100 teeth. So, how do opossums benefit humans? Well, I'm glad you asked because it's very important to know that they do, in fact, benefit humans in a variety of ways. Here's a couple important ones. The answer actually lies within the additional unique abilities of this awesome creature. Marsupials have a lower body and blood temperature than most mammals in North America, which provides an unsuitable incubating environment for most diseases, particularly rabies. It's not impossible for a possum to contract rabies, but it is highly unlikely. Opossums are also immune to most snake venom, except for that of the coral snake, whose neurotoxin venom is the second deadliest venom after the black mamba. It causes rapid paralysis and respiratory failure. Because the opossum is immune to all other venoms, the scientists have isolated a small peptide, which is a small chain of amino acids, and they've isolated that from the opossum, and it's presently being studied further as a uh, use for a human antivenom. Because it's been so successful in, in uh, lab rats, uh, they are starting to uh, use it in studies for humans and it's and, and the preliminaries have been very successful. So this could be a real breakthrough uh, in the anti-venom field. Possums are also extremely clean animals. They largely lack sweat glands which renders them odorless. They clean themselves constantly and meticulously like house cats. And like many small terrestrial mammals, they are magnets for ticks. However, the greatest benefit to humans is they love to eat them. According to the National Wildlife Federation, an opossum will consume over 90% of the ticks that attach to them. They also concluded a study confirmed by the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies that a single opossum can consume up to 5,000 ticks per season, and that areas with a larger opossum population had a significant decrease in the activity to complete elimination of ticks in the area. This is spectacular, folks, and it's a real big breakthrough. And the studies are continuing because these animals are voracious tick eaters. They're omnivorous. They eat everything, and they're very thorough. They'll eat the shells and the bones of everything they eat because they, they, they actually need that calcium. They're very, uh, their body uh, 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 thrives for, for high calcium. Uh, 
Not only will they eat the voles and the moles and the mice outside and all those pesky insects, they are voracious tick eaters. These are nocturnal animals that see excellent at night due to their large dilated pupils. Actually, they, when you look in an opossum, it looks like they have black eyes. That's not the case. They actually have a, a white area in their eyes. It's just that the pupil is so big and dilated, that's mostly what you see. But when they turn their eyes from side to side, you'll see the white uh, of their actual eyeball. They see excellent at night. They communicate with soft clicking sounds and sometimes sneeze-like sounds. Usually the babies will have that <laughs> sound like that and then the mothers will respond with a <laughs> sort of a like a tongue clicking. However, Possums will also growl, they'll hiss, even belch when threatened by a predator. So if their if their hiss, growl, and belching doesn't scare them, and the big flashing of the 50 tooth smile doesn't scare them, they have something even better up their sleeve for the predators that just won't give up. It's called thanatosis. It's a form of tonic immobility, better known as playing dead or playing possum. And although this tends to be one of the characteristics of an opossum that is most notable, it's probably one of the least unique characteristics of the opossum in compared to the animal kingdom. Almost all animals have, can, can have some form of thanatosis, whether it's involuntary or it's induced. Even humans. Playing dead or playing possum is merely a state of natural paralysis. In an opossum, it's involuntary and it's brought on by excessive stress. The comatose state can last up to four hours and usually deters most predators that typically avoid carrion or, or dead rotting flesh, which is what carrion is. This is further accomplished by, by the emission of a most foul and deterring odor from the anus. Now, for an animal who doesn't have sweat glands and is relatively odorless, what comes out of this opossum when it goes into this uh, um, uh, involuntary uh, state of natural paralysis to deter a predator is the most foul smell you'll ever smell. It, 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 it's a complete deal breaker in the appetite department, no doubt about it. Any predator who continues to want to eat from, from an animal who's emitting a smell like this is one tough critter. Another example is where mother cats pick up their kittens, they grab them by the scruff of the neck. Okay, once they do, that baby goes limp. That's, ton that's induced tonic immobility at a very low level. Now, humans have different levels as well. Um, there's one level of tonic immobility for humans, um, such as uh, shock from trauma, okay? Or, or when you're very, very, uh, when somebody is frightened uh, so badly um, or, or startled that they literally freeze, they, they, their muscles tense up and they, they, they freeze. And you've heard of this happening if it hasn't happened to you before. These are, are involuntary um, levels of tonic immobility on humans, but one of the most recognizable and more severe cases would be fainting. Okay, fainting is a a severe human reaction known as tonic immobility. Uh, the opossums are very susceptible to involuntary thanatosis, and uh, even the young can can fall into it quite easily. It's most difficult for opossums because sometimes they'll get struck with this natural paralysis while they're running across the road, okay? The shock of an oncoming car, once noticed, may, may uh, um, uh, induce excessive stress in an opossum, setting it into a state of thanatosis. 
okay? And it'll fall uh, uh, unconscious right there uh, into that comatose state right on the road where it becomes even more vulnerable from other cars, okay? So for those bravest and bold who, who uh, uh, don't mind getting out and checking on roadside opossum to check and see if if in fact they're, they've been killed and if there are uh, young inside the pouch, you might want to check the opossums overall whether you think there are young in there or not. Because it could be an opossum who just actually fell into an involuntary state of thanatosis and if it's still in the road you may be able to get them to the shoulder uh, or, or bring them to a, 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 a vet if it needs medical attention. Um, another interesting creature we have right here at home that I think is one of our most spectacular species of animals, not to get off subject, but to wind this up, is the hognose snake. Now here's a really cool creature. They've got several means of defense. If they're little tail wagon like a, a rattlesnake and them coiled up and their pattern on their body doesn't fool you to think that they're a rattlesnake, well, then they flatten out their necks, like you see in this picture. They flatten out their necks like a cobra, open their mouths wide and start hissing to mimic a cobra. So if, the, if they haven't fooled you with the rattlesnake or the cobra routine, well, they go to their failsafe, much like the opossum. They play dead and again emit a very foul odor along with some uh, foam and saliva. So another great uh, defensive mechanism uh, by our wonderful species in nature. How, how wonderful they are and how interesting they are. From a trapper standpoint, I think it's very important for you to know that if you have a, an opossum issue, these are not animals that usually cause structural damage to your home. If, at the worst case scenario, they might live on, in, under your shed or under your deck. They are nocturnal, so you won't see them during the daytime. As long as you're not leaving food out for cats or dogs outside, you really probably won't see them at all. However, they're great to have around. Don't be so quick to call a trapper or a pest control company to have these animals eliminated. Personally, I have a list of folks locally that are waiting for me to trap opossums from other people's homes so that I can drop them off at their locations. Lists of people. Every summer I get these, okay? So it's important. If you do have an issue, I'm the guy to call. They'll be in good hands and we'll get them to properties where they'll be welcome. They will share their property with the homeowners with no clash of doing so. Okay, now this leads me to the next animal and these animals, okay, don't let people tell you that uh, you're killing them by uh, re-establishing them in areas where they will fight for territory and they would uh, not survive because they can't reacclimate themselves. That is completely untrue. I have studied these animals for the better part of 30 years and I'm telling you folks, these animals can acclimate themselves to anything. You'll find them in rural, urban, wooded, deserts, prairies, mar marshlands, uh, they can uh, take extreme temperatures, hot or cold. They can swim. They can tread water for hours. And they're amazingly smart and intelligent and strong creatures. And that's what we're going to talk to you about now. And that is my favorite friends, the raccoon. This here is the specs of an F-16. Okay, not actually what we're going to be talking about. We're talking about the raccoon. However, I wanted to show you these specs because the specs of the raccoon are quite similar and equally as impressive, almost like that of an F-16. This is, my friends, Procyon Loader. Nature's greatest weapon against, against the pesky humans. I like to call these critters the Marines of the forest. Okay, let's check out some of their stats. They've got a wider lower body and a low center of gravity. And this allows this critter to push over large objects, many of the times much heavier than themselves. They have a collapsible spine which allows them to squeeze through narrow spaces. 
Also, they have a very thin, stretchable body, much like a cat. They have a lot of hair. It makes them seem big, but their bodies are very thin. They preserve memories for specific tasks for up to three years. They also can detect a wide range of noises, even subtle movements of earthworms underground. Their front feet have incredible sensitive network of nerves that relays 3D images to the brain, allowing them to see their food in the dark. Now folks, I, am I explaining to you a high-tech, modernized piece of weaponry? I absolutely am, but it's that in the nature's world, not of human control. So, folks, let me tell you more about this critter, because these animals are not going away, no matter what you think. So you need to learn about them more, and learn to live with them, rather than convince yourself that you're going to eliminate these creatures. It's not going to happen. The Native Americans, the Powhatan tribe, had a word. Aurahu. It meant animal that scratches with its hands. The Mexican word for the raccoon is mapache. It's a derivative of the Aztec word mapachitli, one who takes everything in his hands. Even the scientific name, procyon loader, loader is Latin for one who washes. I remember growing up in the 60s and 70s. We used to watch the Walt Disney Family Sunday specials, okay? There was one in particular that they showed a couple times. I remember it was the people that leave their cabin uh, for the winter and it's springtime now and before the people get back to open up their little cabin in the, in the mountains. But the raccoon grabs the food and he runs to the river and he starts washing the food in the water. And the, com the narrator tells you that how clean the raccoon is and how it washes its food, which in fact isn't really the case at all. In reality, raccoons have a heightened sensitivity to touch. I like to describe this as their front paw pads react to touch sensation, much like our taste buds react to flavor. Okay, so by getting the paws wet, it heightens the sensitivity level, just like a wet tongue would be more sensitive to taste than a dry tongue, okay? So the water is, is when they wash things with their hand, it gives them that better sensation. And they get that three-dimensional picture image in their, uh, um, in their heads even if it's in the dark, but even in the daytime, they get interested in feeling those textures and, 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 and the shapes and the consistencies. And this is what, what uh, 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 makes these animals such great explorers. Their sensitive pads and great hearing also makes them masters of finding underground food, such as grubs, earthworms, even the moles who are after that same food. And let me tell you folks, they can really cause damage. They can, they literally peel up the ground and get right under that grass layer, okay? Not so much digging in the dirt, but just peeling under that layer for the grubs and the earthworms. As long as the food is there, they're gonna keep coming. Just like if you're feeding your cats or your dogs outside, or you're taking care of a feral community where you're leaving food out all the time, or bird feeders even. If you're gonna keep bird feeders filled with food year round, as long as you're giving them food, you're going to attract critters and the raccoons are gonna be the first ones there. This also includes poison. If you're gonna put outdoor rodent control, rodenticides outside in a black box, raccoons will rip them open, they will expose them to maybe your house pets, to children before you find them, and if they tend to eat the whole thing, it's just gonna make them sick. And instead of pooping around your pool, they're gonna vomit and they're gonna have diarrhea around your pool and on your cover. And that's not something you want. So keep the food and poisons out of your yard and the critters will go to the yards where they are available. Raccoons are extremely smart. Um, they climb high up on a rooftop, to get a grand perspective of everything around them at night and all the opportunities that are out there. And while they walk across your roof, 
they also can detect with these sensitive pads, they can detect weak and vulnerable locations in the roof, which if they're inclined, and they usually are, they will breach and explore your rafter or attic space. Even a simple soffit or eave breach will gain them access to a world beyond your walls and ceilings. And if you're really lucky, and you usually will be, and I say that sarcastically, Mama Raccoon will use that attic space as her nursery, where she'll have a large litter of anywhere between two and 10 babies. The average litter is four to six, but as I continue to uh, year after year go through these birthing seasons of trapping, I'm finding that the average is starting to get bigger. And I suspect it has to do with all the available food that's around during the summer, okay? I highly recommend chimney caps as well, folks. To everyone who has a chimney, make sure your chimney caps are installed properly and the flues are closed when you leave the houses during the winter and when you're not using that fireplace. Don't leave them open for ventilation. It's an open door for raccoons or even flying squirrels, so be very careful. Here's the deal, folks. It's pretty simple. You cut down a lot of trees to build a house, and you probably cut down a raccoon's house. So they're going to attempt to make your new home their new home. After all, unless you take into consideration the wildlife, all you're really doing is building a nicer and more accommodating tree for these critters. We are paradise to raccoons. Excluding the overpopulation of pest control companies and nuisance wildlife trappers, like myself, they have an abundance of everything here on the East End. Okay, first of all, food. The shorelines, docks, and marinas supply an endless high-protein sushi bar. Always open. Folks who feed pets outside, feral communities, bird feeders that are left year-round, filled, and of course, the, the great trash can buffet. The food waste alone from many of the summer eateries here in the Hamptons served up, serves up surf and turf with all the gourmet fixings each and every night for our raccoons. Our raccoons eat like royalty with the results, larger sizes, healthier litters, bigger litters. Then during the colder months, we have a large population of folks who migrate south and points elsewhere, leaving their homes vacant. Just perfect squatter homes and nurseries for all these critters, specifically raccoons, and very little burden. And what is burden? They quickly acclimate themselves to. So they're, they're an animal to be reckoned with, rather than, than be, be, uh, uh, be battled against. With all the constant construction, tree and lawn services everywhere, overuse of pesticides, rodenticides, abundance of food availability, and their expertise at problem solving and habitat acclimation, I am clearly certain that raccoons on the East End have become diurnal rather than primarily nocturnal. Most of their signature behaviors may still be preferred at night, however, to see raccoons during the day is absolutely not a reason for immediate panic, nor major concern. In 2006, rabies in raccoons was eliminated through an edible vaccine that was widely distributed throughout Target Long Island locations. Still, raccoons are considered a rabies vector species, along with bats, foxes, and skunks. It's distemper that impacts the raccoons drastically. Distemper is usually fatal to raccoons, unless caught at a very, very early stage when it resembles flu-like symptoms and, and minor respiratory distress. But once it becomes a neurological issue, there's nothing that can be done. Distemper is not contagious to humans. However, it is highly contagious to both canines and felines, and it's easily sp spread throughout highly populated raccoon colonies. Make sure your pets are vaccinated against, against distemper as well as rabies, two of the most important shots. Signs of a sick or distempered raccoon would be disorientation, 
Walking in circles is a, is a really good sign of a sick or disoriented animal. Loss of the use of the back legs. That's another common one. People often call me and say, and a raccoon has been injured, he's been hit by a car, he's crawling through my yard, his back end is not working. That's distemper in most cases. Seizures. Seizures resemble some of the signs of rabies. This is where the confusion comes in. A raccoon seizes, will usually sit up. Its hands will clap like this, okay? It'll chatter its teeth with the big sharp teeth. I know it looks funny, but that's exactly what it does. And then it'll fall backward. And once it hits the ground, it'll usually come to for a minute and start walking in a circle until it sits up again and starts to have a seizure again. That's what it would look like. That's distemper. Also for rabies, however, the only way to prove rabies in an animal only a lab can do that. You cannot look at an animal and tell and say that animal has rabies. It can only be confirmed in a laboratory. Distemper, the signs are much easier to read and is usually always the case too late and would be a fatal situation. I have had the pleasure of rehabbing raccoons for quite a few years now. I've also raised several in an effort to learn more about them and how to live with them rather than find ways of destroying them. I've been in confined spaces with protecting mothers and their young. I've tackled some of the biggest raccoons I've ever seen just to get them back into their proper habitat. Sure, I've had a few angry raccoons, but I still believe the most dangerous element of the raccoon is in their scat and nothing more. And that would be the potential parasite roundworm, Bailey Sascaris procyonis. I say potential because it's not always present in raccoon droppings. It's just too common and too dangerous to humans to ignore. Since it can only be deadly to human health if ingested, I suggest... Do not eat raccoon poop. If you touch it, wash your hands. Don't pick up an apple and eat it. Problem solved. So in conclusion, raccoons are not going anywhere, folks. They can be found from southern Canada, where they are actually a huge problem, to Panama. An average lifespan of a raccoon is three to six years in the wild. Okay, There are six raccoon species native to North and South America. Only Procyon loader resides here in America. One of my favorites is the South American Coada Monday, or the Coati. Uh, this picture here is a picture of Squeaky. He's a Coada Monday uh, that is an educational animal. This Coati is not caged, and it, it has really can, can has free reign to leave the facility and and uh, uh, run away and be a wild animal in, in southern Florida. However, it doesn't, it, it, it hasn't, it won't, and it remains um, uh, an animal that oversees the uh, facility there. And one of my favorites, he's just beautiful. Um, here also is a picture of an albino raccoon. This animal I trapped right here in Amagansett about four years ago. So the big question is, is it possible to raccoon proof your home? Well, absolutely, it can be done. And I've been doing it for the past three or four years now successfully. Of all the amazing abilities the raccoon possesses, it does have a weak spot, and that's patience, okay? And they get extremely anxious with difficult tasks and often give up knowing that there's another hopeful, more vulnerable, location or target right nearby, which is usually the neighbor's house. Both you, me, and the wildlife, we all call this place home. It's all rightfully ours. And I think we should learn to share it. That is a human responsibility. That's it. And I hope uh, this has been helpful and uh, instructional, and I hope you've learned something heard all this before but maybe there's something in there that you didn't know and, um, and maybe this will lead you to learn more you can come back and teach me something which I always welcome you never stop learning life is about learning every day is a new experience and a new life lesson 
And when it comes to nature, they have so much to teach us. So thanks folks, and let me end by saying wildlife matters. Matters.